Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, we talk about four-way and three-way SLI configurations of the GTX 980. We have information about that Samsung 840 Evo performance fix, and both Google and Apple have announced new tablets. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 289, recorded October 16th, 2014. When two GPUs are better than four. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Mandrill. Mandrill is a scalable, reliable, and secure email infrastructure service trusted by more than 300,000 customers. Sign up at mandrill.com, promo code TWIT, and you'll receive 50,000 free email sends per month for your first six months of service. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I am Ryan Shrout. Uh, this is the show on the Twit Network where we talk about, uh, as the name implies, computer hardware. Patrick, not with us today, taking a, a, a leave of absence for a familial birthday party, I believe I was told. So uh, taking his place, uh, the guy from Wyoming, Josh Walrath. Hi, I'm Josh Walrath, and you're all going to be in trouble tonight. <laughs> I knew you lived in Wyoming because your T-shirt says so. It does, and it's brown. It is a brown Wyoming T-shirt. I think we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. What is the character on it's the T-shirt? It's the uh, steamboat. Again? It's the uh, bucking horse. That's right. Okay. Right. It's iconic. Right. See, you know what I'm saying? Now, not only do we talk about PC hardware, we give you, uh, you know, history of the states. Next week, we'll do like Illinois. Or something, you know, weird like that. So, uh, but let's get into hardware stuff from this week. There was a fair amount of news that occurred over the last seven days in terms of computer hardware. Uh, let's start with a quick discussion on SLI. SLI uh, obviously does not stand for Scanline Interleave anymore, Josh. What year did we, what, what year did that change happen? Ah, it's what, uh, 2004 when the, uh, the GeForce 6800 series came out and it was the first SLI capable. And that was after, uh, of course, NVIDIA bought the remains of 3D effects in 2002. Yeah. Did they, did they immediately call it scan or a uh, scalable link interface or was there, I thought there was like a time period where they just called it SLI and they didn't have a name for it or something. But maybe no, not. I think it was it was it was scalable link interface because it had the over the over the top connection that you'd connect with the ribbon and yep, the high end ones could go more than two. Scalable. <sighs> Anyway, uh, so the idea of SLI and Crossfire are, are very easy to describe. Add GPUs to your system, improve gaming performance, graphics performance. Uh, the, the problem is, is in implementation, it's never as easy as the words I just stated make it sound, right? So uh, going from one GPU to two GPUs implies a lot of work in terms of dividing up workloads, uh, compiling that work back together at some point on a different piece of hardware or on one of those two pieces of hardware, uh, making sure that those workloads are balanced between processors, uh, making sure that there's no data discrepancies between the processors. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, and then when you add three or four cards into that mix, like if you're doing three or four different GPUs all trying to work together on the same game or rendered scene or whatever it happens to be, you're adding more complication to that mix. Um, with that brief introduction, we bring you to the story uh, where I tested the new GeForce GTX 980, which is uh, NVIDIA's latest flagship graphics card based on Maxwell, the new GM204 GPU. We've talked about it on the show a couple of times. Um, a very impressive GPU in its own right, very power efficient, very high performance in general, uh, and uh, apparently sold out everywhere now. Interestingly enough, so hopefully NVIDIA is making more of them to actually sell to people. Uh, and in that initial review, we looked at two-way SLI with GTX 980, and it actually seemed to scale pretty well. Uh, but as it as so happens, every once in a while, other cards happen to filter through the office. So for a specific portion of time, we actually had access to three and four 
of the GTX 980 reference cards. And I think it makes sense, Josh, that when you have access to that much hardware, you just throw it all together and see what happens, right? Yes, you abuse it while you can and then yes. send it back broken. Hey, you know, once it's out of my hands, it's not my problem. It's probably FedEx. Yeah. Probably, probably FedEx. Um, <clears throat> so I will say that setting up, so in order to do four-way SLI, or even three-way SLI for that matter, you have to have specific hardware configurations. You know, you need to check to make sure that kind of stuff works. Motherboard layout is very important for four-way SLI. Uh, PCI Express layout is what's important for three-way SLI. Can your motherboard even support more than two cards in SLI? Uh, Software-wise, though, if you have the hardware put together, it's actually pretty easy. Like, the difference between enabling four-way SLI and two-way SLI is there is actually no change. You go into the control panel, you say, I want to uh, select maximum 3D performance, and it goes, okay, great. Now we're using all four GPUs in your system. It's really just that simple. Now, uh, at the bottom of that first page, something worth pointing out because it will determine how you, you know, if you go look at this review, if you see all the percentage numbers, how all this relates, right? So, um, as you add GPUs, the scaling rate should increase in a standard pattern, right? Ideally, if you get 15 frames per second with one card, you want 30 with two, 45 with three, and 60 for four. Um, but what that means percentage-wise is in that graph that uh, we're showing right now, at, with two cards, you could possibly at the most ideally scale at 100%. You would double your performance, right? You go from 15 to 30 frames per second or whatever it is. Uh, when you add a third card though, the maximum performance gain you can have over the two card configuration is 50%. So that's your theoretical maximum there. And then by adding the fourth card, uh, based on uh, patterns and math, uh, apparently that number is 33%. So the most you could get from that fourth card is another 33% in performance, uh, in overall performance, right? So keep that in mind as we go look through some of these results. So I want to start by talking about a good result. That makes sense, Josh? We want to talk about something positive. Um, give us a little bit you know, of... It's, just, it's, uh, it's like you're in a meeting and they're they're going over your performance. You know, it's, yeah. it's the carrot, the stick, <laughs> the carrot. <laughs> Yeah. So let's look at Crisis 3. So because Crisis 3 is, uh, in my opinion, probably the most demanding game we use in our testing still. And it also happens to be one of the few games that actually scales really well across that entire band of SLI. So if you look at the Crisis 3 page, even if you look at 25 by 14, we have 4K testing in this story as well. And what you'll see is as you scale up from one to two to three to four GPUs, you actually get fairly... Uh, regular, you know, well-spaced performance improvements. It seems to be scaling very well as you add GPUs. Uh, if you go down and look at the FPS by percentile graph, you'll see that in kind of a different form. You'll see it. You go from about 29 frames per second to about 51 or 52 to about 78 to about 96 frames per second uh, on average, right? So you're again, this is a game that actually scales really well. And the same thing is seen at 4K, those same kind of, of jumps, right? And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can actually get a bar graph that just kind of labels that out in its, in its easiest to view form. So if you look at it there, um, at 4K, two-way SLI scales by 92%. That's pretty close to 100, wouldn't you say, Josh? Yes, 92% is closer to 100 than 50 uh, it is, yes. Three-way scales by 39%. That's that's pretty good. Com that's, again, the, the target maximum is 50% for three-way SLI. And then four-way is 29%. So you're actually getting very, very close to that 33% kind of maximum scaling rate that you would uh, have expected to get there. And the total scaling ratio from one card to four cards is 3.48x. Um, and I would consider that to be about as good as you're going to get with uh, multi-GPU scaling today, right? That's like a classic, your best case scenario. This is like your 3D mark results, like, but this is a real world game test. Now, let's look at one that doesn't look great and kind of surprisingly so, Battlefield 4. Uh, Battlefield 4, if we just go, we'll just go ahead and go straight to, uh, there's a page there, or a graph called Frame Times, and you'll see this pink and green mess in the middle of a graph. And what it's basically telling you is that 
frame times, once you add in that third or fourth card, get really weird. They bounce back and forth a lot. They're not consistent. You get a lot of high frame times and a lot of low frame times uh, on the next, on the Battlefield 4 page there, Burke, sorry. Uh, and the result is that from one to two cards, you actually get really, really good scaling. Let's see. Uh, I think my metric says here you're actually getting something like, um, where's that at? Like, uh, you're going, uh, no, I can't do my wow, math. Wow, looks like, like Mickey Mouse puked on that graph. <laughs> yeah. And what's actually more, if you look there in that graph, like the black line, that's a single card. Very thin line, very smooth. There's an orange line behind the pink and green mass that you can kind of see at the far right uh, of the graph. And that is actually two-way SLI. And it's fairly thin. It's very consistent. But then the pink and the green are pretty. They're, they're, not, they're not pretty, I guess I'll say. Um, and the result is like even at 4K, Battlefield 4 goes from 29 frames per second to 51 frames per second, which is a really good scaling rate. Uh, but then it goes from 51 to 60 uh, and then like 60 to 62 or something like that, right? So very, very poor scaling with that third and fourth card. Uh, Bioshock Infinite sees similar poor scaling. Grid 2 seems similar poor scaling. Metro Last Light's not good either. Uh, the only other game that we tested that had Positive, I would say, um, three and four way SLI scaling was Sniper Elite 3. But then you're talking about even at 4K with two cards, you're over 100 frames per second. So scaling to from 100 to 150 and from 150 to 198, that's really, really good scaling, but it's not um, necessarily useful scaling, I guess, right? You know, at 25 by 14, you're running at 350 frames per second with four GTX 980s, which maybe is a little bit overkill. So uh, what's your kind of takeaway from these results, Josh? Does this make, I, I don't know, like do, do we, is, is three-way and four-way SLI or Crossfire for that matter a, a complete bust or is it just, It you depends know, on it, what, what you're willing to spend and what you're willing to put up with in terms of variance in, in your frame, frame times because obviously when you get to three and four, your variance just goes kind of crazy. So you got yeah. some fast frames in there, and then it may chug, and then fast. Um, when you're talking, you know, power, heat, noise, well, you haven't covered those things much yet, but uh, it's the law, the law of diminishing returns after two cards just seems to be pretty harsh on anything going three to four. And so yeah. I don't know if I would even... Even if I had the room and then the room in my wallet to get three <laughs> cards, I think I'd just stick with two. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at, right? Like, like if you look at Crisis Three, there is one case, and I'm sure there are other games out there that scale. Well. I think Tomb Raider is another game uh, that scales very well with uh, Beyond Two Card SLI. But every time, you know, from a, a technological standpoint, every time you add a card past one, really, you are increasing complications and potential issues, right? And what in AMD and NVIDIA have done is they've really kind of focused on that two-card configuration because it's by far the most common multi-GPU um, solution out there. So they, they spend a lot of time on that. They push the developers to spend a lot of time on that. And once you get beyond that, it's kind of, it almost kind of seems like a luck of the draw. Is it going to work? Is it not? Because if you look at a game like Metro Last Light, it's very demanding on a GPU. And you would expect it to scale beyond two cards, but it but it really doesn't. So um, you did mention plus, power consumption. Plus you are, yeah, go ahead. yeah well, go to the thing. Um, with three or four cars, you're really starting to increase the load probably on the CPU as well because you've got the CPU sending a frame with all the data to the first card. Then it does the second frame, then third and fourth. And then it's waiting for that first one to finish rendering. But it's also getting all the input from AI, the user, whatnot, and it's got to figure out where the best place to send that next frame and when. Yeah. And it just gets confusing. Some, with Sometimes it's two. complicated for it, obviously, and sometimes it kind of works out, right? So it's, it's kind of a hit or miss thing. Uh, and, and if you look at some of those games like Battlefield 4, adding in a third GPU actually makes it a worse experience, right? Not just it doesn't improve the experience, it actually makes it a worse experience because... Um, you are 
running at maybe a couple of frames per second average higher, but your frame variance is much higher, which makes you more likely to see stutters and, you know, unsmooth animations on the screen. So there would be instances maybe where if you have three cards or four cards, you kind of run back to a single GPU or run back into, you know, two-way GPU uh, performance settings, which would obviously be a disappointment. You spent $2,000 on video cards, you're only going to use 1000 for Battlefield 4. Um, not ideal. I will say one thing that didn't impress me was the power consumption numbers there, uh, which I think Burke had up a little bit ago. The, the, the GTX 980 we knew to be a very power efficient GPU. It was able to outperform the, the R9 290X while using like 130 watts less power with one card. Uh, doing four-way SLI, we were only drawing about 689 watts. And this is with Crisis 3. This is what we were putting our maximum load on the GPU, uh, on the collection of GPUs, rather. And, you know, looking at that, you could really probably get away running a four-way SLI system with like an 800 or 850 watt power supply. That might be a little bit close for a couple of spikes every once in a while. Yeah, um, good luck in finding an 800 watt power supply with that many cables for PCI. That's true. Eight, you have to have eight PCI Express cables for that. So that that might be tough. Um, but it's more interesting to me, like when we did uh, when we did our R9 295 X2 crossfire testing, which was four 290X GPUs. Um, if you remember at the time, we had a 1200 watt power supply for our test bed and it wasn't enough. We actually ran two of the cards off of a separate 850 watt power supply that we were running off to the side. Right now, you don't need that much power, but you do need a 1500 watt power supply to really run a four card setup of R9 290Xs reliably. So that's like half the power supply necessary that you need for the four 980s. Right? That's mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty impressive. Even if if you take the performance aspect out of it, um, you know, which is kind of hard to do really when you're talking about this much money um it's an it's an impressive technological feat that they're able to do to get all this kind of working in that power envelope so neat stuff yeah mm. good designs uh, but but maybe don't buy it <laughs> maybe. maybe maybe that's a recommendation uh the other big story this week was the release of the samsung 840 evo performance fix uh, from Samsung directly. I know that's something we've talked about on the show several times as well. Uh, the A40 Evo, probably, I'd say, the most popular SSD for enthusiasts over the last year. Um, we, we found about a month ago, was it a month ago, two months ago, something like that, where yeah. it had a significant performance problem where data that had been written to the SSD and had just kind of remained there for a while would slowly degrade in performance based on the amount of time that it sat there on the SSD. So this is this is this is not an uncommon thing. So you install Battlefield Talk 4. Talk about stale data. <laughs> it, it that's pretty much what it's like, right? Yeah. Like even technically it's what it's like. So you install Battlefield 4 uh, through Origin, you write it to the disk and all you're doing at that point forward is reading it. You're never writing over those files again, right? And that turns out to be what was happening was that if you didn't rewrite files, it would slow down dramatically. And like, if you look at that graph there, this is one of our, the drives that we had here that happened to have had data on it that sat for a very long time. You're looking at like 60 megabytes per second, as opposed to 400, 350, 450, whatever it was supposed to be, uh, megabytes per second. And this is read speeds. This is not write speeds necessarily, uh, or not, not, it is not write speeds at all. It is read speeds, which is disappointing. And people found this out by somebody saying, hey, you know, I noticed that my game loads slower than it used to. Why would that be the case? And so we did a bunch of testing. We've talked about what, what the results were. But the fix from Samsung is a two-parter. You install a firmware and then you run a tool that they call a, what do they call it? It's a like performance, performance restoration tool. Yeah, you write it. Yeah, performance restoration. And the thing, here's what's interesting. Alan's not here, but he doesn't know what it does. Nobody really knows what it does. Samsung isn't telling you what this tool actually does to your data. Uh, all indications are that it's basically 
reading some data and writing it. Like it's just basically moving it around the dri the disk once so that everything is kind of refreshed back to its maximum uh, performance level, right? Because voltages will be reset at that point on all the on all the flash. So uh, you need to have like 10%, is it 10%? You need to have 10% free capacity yeah. for this to work. Uh, it only works in Windows today. It doesn't work if you're in a RAID array. It doesn't work if you're in Linux or Mac. It doesn't work if uh, you have multiple partitions, I don't think. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on, on, on how the fix works today. They're promising by the end of this month, an ISO version that will run on Mac, that will run on, you know, it's you basically put it on a boot drive, right? So it, it is operating system independent, and it would apparently do the same thing. We'll see uh, how that pans out and what the timing is. But a as you look at this, Josh, there are still questions like, is this a, an actual permanent fix? Is the firmware going to be a permanent fix and the restoration tool just kind of used to reset everything? Do you think we'll have the same problem in four weeks when we come back and look at these drives, which we will inevitably do? We might. Um, TLC is an interesting uh, topic these days in terms of just how it holds up over where. And now we're seeing this issue with uh, the Samsung drives, both the 840 and the 840 Evo. Uh, we don't know if this is going to be seen in the, uh, the 3D VNAND that uh, they're putting out with the uh, supposed 850 Evo that will eventually be showing up. Um, my gut feeling is that they will eventually kind of fix it with a firmware. But then I kind of question, if it's rewriting a lot of data, is that going to be using up your write cycles in the background that you didn't know about? And what kind of lifespan do we expect from these drives? I mean, obviously... These are questions that you uh, you need to ask Alan. He's the uh, right. he's the pro, but uh, you know I, I probably know enough to be dangerous with the knowledge <laughs> I have of SSDs. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of results we have in uh, yeah in the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months. I haven't I haven't used this on my uh, OS drive yet, and I really don't want to. It's slow, my drive, but it's a little bit I scary. Don't. We did lose data on one of the drives that we converted. Uh, Ironically, the one that he borrowed from one of my test systems uh, is the one that uh, lost all of its data. Luckily, it was just game data, and we downloaded it all from Steam again. But uh, I can understand your hesitancy to update. Anytime you update the firmware on, on an SSD or something like that, like th there's a potential for data loss there. So always back that crap up. And it makes it much more of a pain in the, pain in the butt to do, but you should, you should still probably do it. Um, we will have more updates on this going forward. And, you know... One thing that if you read some of the comments on that story that, and on the YouTube video that we posted today discussing it, the issue is for Samsung is the internet doesn't forget things, right? So even though this may be an only a one-time thing, you know, their, their next Evo drive that comes out won't have this issue. The 850 is using totally different flash technology. Um, and so if there's an 850 Evo that comes out, it will be using 3D NAND. Um, there will be this kind of negative sentiment towards them going forward, just like there was and kind of continues to be for OCZ, right? That, hey, you know, once that, bitten, twice shy. Yeah, yeah. There's, and there's everybody still remembers the quality there. problems that ABIT had, and they haven't even been a company for the past decade. <laughs> and, and the same thing can be said about, like, AMD drivers, right? People still complain yep. about, oh, AMD's graphics drivers are the worst. And it's like, I mean... That was, you know, if you look back uh, five, seven years ago, yeah, they were awful. And now they're they're fine. They're not great necessarily, but they're fine. Like, there's no reason to to complain not about to. it. But yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, check out that story if you have an Evo. If you know somebody with an 840 Evo, it is uh, worth reading and seeing all of Alan's kind of recommendations and uh, uh, thoughts on the process. Uh, let's touch on real quickly a couple of Lenovo things. Do real we have quick. To? Okay. Yeah, I, th I think so. We'll make it real quick. This one I like. Uh, so Lenovo announced a bunch of new machines uh, last week. The starting with uh, the new Yoga Three Pro, which is uh, you know the Yoga line is that that laptop line that they have that that's very flexible. Josh, you should know all about this. It's very flexible. It can fold back on itself. Uh, you know, it can uh, uh, kind of like my self-esteem. 
Yeah. 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 It just yeah. folds yeah. right back on itself. Yeah. It disappears into nothing. Exactly. Uh, What's interesting about the Yoga 3 Pro, a couple things. One, it has the Intel Core M processor, which is a Broadwell Y part, right? So this is the first 14 nanometer CPU from Intel. Uh, I've written, I did a performance preview on it uh, at ID, no, was it at IDF? Yeah, it was from IDF. And uh, we talked about the 14 nanometer technology and the Broadwell Y architecture on PCPro.com several times. Um, they also have this really cool, hinge thing that I want to see in person. They call it a watch band style hinge that is built from 800 pieces of aluminum and steel to achieve a thin yet flexible hinge with six focus points that resembles a metal watch band. I just think it that looks must cool. be inattentive to assemble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean it's I mean it's it's a high end device. It's 13, 13 inch screen, thirty two hundred by eighteen hundred resolution. Uh, QHD plus is what they call that on the monitor. Uh, Core M seventy processor, uh, which is the processor we went used in our performance testing from uh, uh, IDF. Eight gigs of memory, two hundred fifty six gig SSD, up to uh, available in champagne gold. So there's that. Ooh. And apparently a starting price of thirteen forty nine, although. Who knows what the highest end derivative thereof might be. Um, and then they also announced the Yoga 14, much less interesting, Core i5 Haswell processor, GeForce 840M GPU, kind of more of your, your normal everyday laptop. So that the Yoga 3 Pro looks interesting, but in the Yoga brands... Did you know Aston Kutcher was like, uh, has a, a degree in engineering and product design? Yeah, he went to MIT, right? I don't know. He has a PhD from there. He graduated with Lisa Sue. He has a FID from there. FID um, from MIT. <laughs> so they, they're announcing Yoga tablets came out a while ago. I actually liked them a lot. They were Android-based tablets, unique design, really long battery life, uh, not the best software side of stuff. Uh, but they announced new 8- and 10-inch versions of those. Um, running the Atom Z3745. So this is the Bay Trail based architecture. Um, the previous ones were using ARM processors. They have an 8-inch Android and Windows and a 10-inch Android and Windows machine. And for some reason, the Windows versions are heavier. They are heavier. It's the extra bits involved. Yeah. And you got to fill all those capacities with uh, extra Windows bits and bytes. So I'm not exactly sure what's why that's the case. Um, uh, but they're claiming like battery life up to 18 hours on these tablets, which is pretty good, especially considering they start at $249 for the 8-inch uh, Android version, $299 for the 10-inch Android version, and then uh, $299 and $399 for the two Windows models. Those are kind of interesting. And then the last thing I'll mention here about uh, Lenovo is they had a... So they, Imagine a Yoga Tablet 2 Pro that is a, a larger, higher-resolution screen, uh, the same processor hardware, the Atom Z3745, but then it has a Pico projector coming out of that barrel on the side. <laughs> a, uh, what is it? 40 50 to 50 lumens. lumens. How yeah. bright would you say 40 to 50 lumens is? That's a very dim flashlight. Yeah. Very dim. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like, what you mean? It's, it's, so you have to sit. It's it's on the tablet, so you have to set the tablet on a table pointing at a wall, very closely, a very mm -hmm. close wall, and uh, in a very dark room. <laughs> in a very dark room. <laughs> it just, it's like it's like an interesting idea. Like, hey, we've got this weird shaped space. What can we do with it? We could put a projector there. Also, like, is it like how loud is it? How loud is the fan on the projector? When we had that gigabyte, at fifty lumens, not. Very, I mean, you probably well, okay. got a single LED in there. and Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If it's quiet yeah. then. And also, this tablet only runs Android. There's no Windows version of the tablet, the, the, what is it, the Yoga Tablet 2 Pro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, that's to save weight so they could put the projector in. <laughs> you got to save those 0 .03 yeah. Yeah. pounds. You know, the thing about the Atoms, uh, aren't these the processors that Intel is doing the Lend-Lease program with Lenovo? where Lenovo doesn't actually have to pay him back for the processors. I want, I want a deal like that. Yeah, well, that's why the mobility group in uh, Intel made $1 million in revenue this last quarter. I guess $1 if you give everything dollars. away. 
Yeah, yeah. That'll happen. Right. So anyway, hopefully we'll get some of that interesting. I don't. I, I definitely want to try the Yoga Three Pro with that weird hinge and the Core M. Hopefully, I, I was curious when those are actually actually going to be available. But for now, let's take a quick break as we filter through our hardware news for the week to talk about today's sponsor. It's a new one for us. It's a new one for me for this week in computer hardware. These are uh, the guys at Mandrill. M A N D R I L L. They are a scalable reliable and secure email infrastructure service uh, trusted by more than 300,000 customers. That's a lot. That's a lot of customers. 300,000 is a lot of customers. So if you're not familiar with this company, um, a little bit of background, right? So this is an easy to set up and integrate uh, service. You can, you can integrate it with existing applications. It's incredibly fast. You, uh, you can deliver, track, and analyze and look at Detailed delivery reports for uh, detailed delivery reports for this email service. Advanced analytics, a friendly interface uh, means that your entire team, from the developers to the marketers, can very easily monitor and evaluate email performance. Uh, with servers all over the world, Mandrill can deliver your email in milliseconds, which um, I guess that's pretty important. I never really thought about it. Like we use email services as well. And, and getting that email out quickly, especially if it is a, a uh, time-sensitive topic, news-related, for example, that's, that's definitely very important. Mandrill started as an idea in 2010, growing fast and innovating faster. Mandrill is now the largest email as a service platform on the market. Um, they are uh, started by the same guys that run MailChimp as well. A little fact there. Uh, you can use Mandrill to send automated one-to-one -one emails like password resets and welcome messages, as well as marketing emails and customized newsletters. So if you're working on any kind of service, if you're looking on working on a website, you're integrating, looking to integrate email services, these are the guys you want to look out. Uh, they've made it for developers. They love documentation, uh, integrations, high delivery rates, web hooks, and analytics. These sound like Josh's kind of people. They love documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mandrill comes with a beautiful interface flexible template options, custom tagging, advanced tracking, and reports. And Mandrill is the only email infrastructure service with a mobile app that lets you monitor delivery and troubleshoot from wherever you are. So that's kind of cool. Um, so how can you take advantage of this powerful, scalable, and affordable service? You don't have to take our word for it. Right now, Mandrill is offering the Twit audience a special deal. Sign up at mandrill.com, M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L, Dot com and use promo code TWIT <clears throat> and you'll receive 50,000 free email sends per month for your first six months of service. 50,000 free email sends. Josh, I'm not going to ask you, this is going to be a question where I don't actually expect a response. What would you use 50,000 free email spends per month? The idea is just boggle the mind. Uh, yeah, I could, I could really promote joshtech.com. You, you could definitely do that. Uh, so let's go I to could. Mandrill. Let's instead, let's instead go to Mandrill.com, M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L.com and use promo code TWIT for the 50,000 free email sends per month for those first six months of service. And we thank Mandrill for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. So would that work for your uh, subscription emails when uh, I think you go it live on something? Yeah, and I think I like the idea of getting them... Uh, in milliseconds. I want yeah. everybody to yeah. know when I'm live immediately because I want them to come watch me be live. Yeah. Like right now. Like right now. Uh, let's talk about a couple of other news items that occurred this week. Samsung announces 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Uh, 802.11 AD, as they call it. Uh, and the Samsung claims that they have overcome the barriers for commercialization. Uh, my, so I'm gonna, Josh, I'm going to ask you, what would you use this for? But I'm going to ask you that. <laughs> After I state that this band has several disadvantages, including One or two. resonance with oxygen molecules uh, and its opacity to many solid objects, otherwise known as walls and stuff. So, you know, this is going to be awesome for Wi Fi on Mars. Yeah, no oxygen. Yeah, nothing, yeah. no, no, uh, no solid walls. objects to get in yeah. the way. Yeah. Okay. So, what would we on Earth? use Y gig for? Uh, hey, let's say you're in a small classroom right. and you want to connect fast. You can do that. And your your signal won't be going out of the walls. So 
You're not going to get as much interference from other things in the same band. Uh, but yeah, the limitations are, are there. I mean, you're not going to put it in the middle of your house and expect to, uh, get good connection, uh, you know, through three walls and one floor. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's going to be limited in what they can do. And certainly in open air arena as well, you're only going to get so far because of the said interaction with the interference of oxygen atoms and their and their vibration. That's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. It's so interesting. I, I think um, hopefully what we'll see is so you're talking about uh, what's the what's kind of like the bandwidth of this? It is a four point six gigabits. Yeah. Yeah, it's five hundred and sixty three megabytes per second or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think what the idea is is uh, say you have a laptop like this and it has Y gig support and you sit down at your desk at your house or at your desk at your office. And rather than have to connect any wires to your external storage or your monitor or, you know, your other devices, your headsets, your mice, your keyboards, whatever, it's using um, something like 802.11 AD for that very small range communication, very high speed, but low range communication, right? So, I've got uh, an external, you know, RAID array of SSDs here uh, for external storage because I don't need that when I'm traveling with the laptop. I plop it down and I have access to that wirelessly at, uh, you know, 560 or 570 megabytes per second, right? And then my just my external 4K displays run off of it or something as well. So I, I imagine that's a good use case for it as well. If you have a lar a, a smallish open air space, kind of like we have here at our office where we don't have any walls so I can keep an eye on Ken and Allen and make sure they're doing the work they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ygig might be useful for that as well. So, hey. You need to move out uh, here so that you could look over my shoulder and make sure I do work. I'd probably perform a lot better. <laughs> you think? Yeah, well, we've got uh, a great tax structure in the state. So you'll be, you know, you'll be really happy. I tell you what, if we can, let's say, earn even 1% of the profit that the next company we're going to talk about has earned... Uh, then I will absolutely move out to Wyoming to watch you. So uh, nice how much money courses. did Intel make mm. last quarter? <sighs> mucho, mucho dinero. Uh, their revenue, gross revenue, was yeah. $14.55 billion. Let's compare that against AMD, which announced today, which was $1.45 billion. So 10 times what AMD made in revenue. So I would like to numbers. point out before before you move forward, um, one percent of that is one hundred and forty five point five million dollars. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we made that. Hold on, let me. No, we did not make one hundred and forty five million dollars last year. So I will not be moving out to uh, Wyoming. Thank you. Proceed. Yeah. Uh I believe that their uh, net revenue, well, net income was approximately $3.55 billion. Again, double, <laughs> double that, a little bit more than double, almost triple, of uh, what AMD, again, made mm. in overall revenue. Yeah. So uh, Intel has done very well for themselves. Uh, the PC market for them is still strong. The server market is, is, again, very strong. They've had growth in both of those areas. So while AMD, and we can talk about AMD or you can talk about it next week, um, while they're complaining about softness, uh, Intel is anything but saying things yeah, are robust. I, I, I found that the most interesting thing about AMD is they, they said, oh, a weak PC market hurt us, whereas Intel's like, uh, it seemed pretty strong. So what do you, I mean, what do you make of that? I, I I guess it's just uh, I'm sorry about the phone. My That's wife right. apparently can't answer it. Um, it's all where you stand because Intel has people come to them and say, "Hey, we want these products." People are not going to AMD and saying, "We want these products." So Intel is selling a lot yeah. of their stuff, and so things are robust for them. AMD uh, does not have products that are as overall competent as what Intel offers at a lot of the same price points, mm -hmm. even though AMD may have better 3D graphics in their APUs and, uh, you know, price performance certainly uh, is a little bit better for them. When you look at the entire uh, product, 
uh, TDPs, performance, chipsets, software functionality uh, for like, you know, SATA drives and, and uh, the SATA controllers and USB ports. Uh, things at Intel just seem to work a little bit better. And so they shipped, I believe, 100 million parts this quarter, which is a record for them. Uh, the revenue was a overall record for the entire lifetime of the company per quarter. Uh, revenue was right up there as well. So they're uh, they're doing good. And again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was one dim spot. You know, here's this company that that did nine billion in revenue uh, with with PC, notebook, and uh, you know convertible processors. Nine billion. Their uh, Oh, what was it? Uh, the servers, I believe, were 500 million. Yeah. No, they got to be more than that. Anyway, uh, no, something like, you know, 5 billion. I can't remember exactly. And then, yes, their mobility, which are handsets, tablets, basic phones, small internet devices. They had a revenue of 1 million. And so that's... That's a really kind of dim thing. And not only that, but it decreased by 98% from last quarter. So they had about 1.9 something million in revenue last quarter, and they dropped down to 1 million. So yeah, Lenovo, everybody else, they're getting very inexpensive processors from Intel. Very inexpensive isn't like free? Pretty much. Three ninety nine. Yeah, and the best thing Maybe. about that is that, uh, what was I saying? Uh, the loss for that group in this quarter was just slightly over $1 billion. Eh. They, they may need to shore up. I mean, between friends, when I've got 3.55, <laughs> that um, I can just throw out that problem. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Mm. Uh, a couple of things real quick. Uh, new phones and tablets from... The, the Googles and the Apples. Um, well, okay. So Google announced the Nexus 6 phone phablet. I hate that term. It's a 6-inch 2560 by 1440 resolution phone. Uh, I think 6 inches might be too big for me to use as a phone. But uh, an impressive piece of hardware um, built by Motorola. It basically looks like a Moto X just blown up a little bit. It's got that new Qualcomm Snapdragon 805. It's got Adreno 420 graphics. It has... Um, a, a fast charge that you can get apparently, quote, six hours of use from only 15 minutes of charging time. Um, that would be impressive. It's also, of course, the first phone that will run Lollipop uh, when it comes out. Now, it is not as inexpensive as previous Nexus phones have been. The 32 gig model will be $650 and the 64 gig model, 700 bucks. Uh, and I believe Boy, that's kind of like five, Apple prices. It is, yeah. yeah. They're they're pretty high up there. I mean, it's no. I mean, the the iPhone six plus is eight forty nine for the sixty four gig model. So they're one hundred fifty dollars less than the iPhone six plus uh, at the same. Capacity. But these don't bend as nicely. <sighs> well, we don't know that yet. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Maybe they will. Uh, impressive hardware. Not a great. Not a not a drastically impressive price. I'm. I, I want to try one. But I, I'm almost positive I don't want to use a six-inch phone. Uh, I mean, that's that's noticeably bigger than even the iPhone six plus. Uh, and then they announced the next. Do you remember nine. years ago? Just to interrupt you, you yeah, got go one of the first Galaxy Notes, and I said, "Oh, is that your new phone?" And you held it up and you laughed, and it's this <laughs> the same damn size as some of these new ones coming out. So, what was yeah. comedy years ago is now reality. Uh, I think maybe more impressive than the Nexus 6 is the Nexus 9. Uh, this is a tablet, a, a new tablet kind of going between the Nexus 7 and the Nexus 10 that is a 9-inch screen, IPS, 2048 by 1536. So it is a 4 by 3 uh, aspect ratio. It will run Lollipop, of course. But maybe more interestingly, it runs the um, Tegra K1 processor that has the custom 64-bit Denver processing cores. In it, which I find to be very interesting. This is the first device to integrate uh, NVIDIA's custom core architecture. Uh, this is not an off the shelf ARM part. This is more or less what Apple does with their A8s. This is kind of what uh, Qualcomm does with Crate. And now 
you know, we've heard about Denver for a long time. And uh, this is a dual core iteration of it that we'll actually be able to pre-order starting tomorrow. Uh, and it looks like I'm going to have to go buy one uh, in order so we can test it and play around with it and see what it is like. I don't know. Any thoughts, Josh? Like, what do we, I mean, eh? just wait and see. Yeah, it's going to be wait and see. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how well it actually performs in the wild because it has that interesting translation um, layer that it stores a bunch yep. of commonly used instructions in a 128 meg cache in main, main memory so that, uh, you know, remember what Transmeta used to do with their, I think, what, Caruso processor? I mean, this is just ages ago. Yeah. That they converted uh, x86 to their own kind of microcode and uh, ran it from there. They said it was more power efficient. Didn't really work out that well. I think that NVIDIA has a better chance of getting this to work because uh, we don't have as big a memory constraints. And I mean, the, the supercomputing power that they have to model out these things at just the, the NVIDIA headquarters is, you know, magnitudes better of what we had again 15 years ago. And so I, I would imagine it's going to work fairly well and it's going to be competitive what Apple has with the, uh, the, the A57 from ARM that it's doing to its members. And I'm kind of curious if uh, Crate's going to have a 64-bit or if Qualcomm's just going to take a 57 and just stay with that for a while. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I would assume they'll do their own. Eventually. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Maybe that's not right away. So uh, that will be launching soon. And then on the Apple side, um, they did launch a new iPad Air 2 that uses a A8X a, a SoC uh, it has Touch ID. Uh, what else is new about it? I think it's really just it, right? There's no big spec changes otherwise. And then the iPad Mini 3, which really the actual, the only spec difference is the uh, inclusion of uh, Touch ID there. So they announced that. Uh, and then more interestingly, the iMac with the 5K display. It's a 27-inch screen, likely the same panel as uh, that Dell 27-inch 5K that we've seen a couple of times. Uh, I think it was announced in uh, June or something like that. They announced at Computex. 5120 by 2880 resolution. Uh, and this is actually available today, apparently. You can order it on their website or go into the Apple Store and pick it up starting at $24.99. Uh, powered by uh, up to... Um, I guess the Devil's Canyon processor, essentially, 4 gigahertz Core i7 Haswell part, uh, and AMD Mobility Radeon GPUs, M290X or M295X, uh, which specifications are light in that regard. Everybody pretty much assumes that the 295X, the M295X or the Mobility 295X is a Tonga-based GPU roughly equivalent to the R9 285. So if you're looking for estimates for uh, performance, that would be uh, what you would expect there. Um, any any feedback on on a, on a 5K iMac shipping today with, with this kind of specs? I mean, it, it almost seems a little bit underpowered. A little underpowered and uh, just a little overkill. I mean, you're not going to be doing a whole lot of 3D gaming at 5K resolutions with just an R9 285. That's going to kind of hurt. But boy, that's got to be a lovely, lovely screen. If you figure that, uh, you know, a lot of handheld devices in the 5-inch the class, um, their pixels per inch are just so incredibly small, it would only take a matter of time before they applied that technology to larger panels when they can control the defects a lot better than, you know, just spitting out a bunch of smaller panels. And, and you know, it's the same problem as, you know, big dies versus little dies and the amount of defects that you're going to get, you know, per square, per millimeter square. Uh, but, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, the, that's got to be the priciest part of that entire computer other than maybe the magnesium frame, if that's, in fact, what it is. Um, they also uh, they also claim that they built their own T-Con for this panel. Uh, so the Dell screen is actually a uh, multi-head device. It's an MST, multi-stream transport device, because DisplayPort doesn't have 
capability to run a 51, was it 51, whatever, 5120 by 2888 resolution panel over single stream. And Apple said that they are running it over a single TCON, which essentially means that they are likely overclocking a DisplayPort connection between uh, the graphics card and uh, the panel in order to get that to work uh, correctly. So that would be yeah, interesting for somebody don't have to, to tear apart look. Yeah, so, so they don't have to go through a long cable. They probably can do that a little bit easier because it's all yeah. just probably right on the same circuit board. Yeah, it, it, and but I think they won't be able to actually claim it uses DisplayPort because it's breaking a DisplayPort standard. Yeah. Yeah, essentially, um, it'll be interesting once once somebody like iFixit gets one and, and tears it down. I'll, I'll be curious to see what that uh, what that infrastructure looks like. Uh, so that is it for the news. We're going to go into uh, maybe a question or two here running a little bit long. We do need your emails, people. Twitch at twit.tv. T.W.I.C.H. T.W.I.C.H. At twit.tv uh, and that is the email address that uh, goes to me and I kind of filter through all the spam and crap that we get uh, and uh, LinkedIn requests for some reason and uh, pull out questions every once in a while for that like this one which I think will be interesting for the two of us to answer Josh okay this comes in from Bradley about mixed SSD raid I have accumulated four 240 to 256 gigabyte per second SSDs or gigabyte SSDs. Yeah. Two Corsair 240 gigs, an older Samsung 256, and a new SanDisk 240 I found on sale. I'd like to use them all as primary system and data drives. What would be the most useful configuration to maximize storage and redundancy? Does the different capacities or do the different capacities manufacturers make a difference? I'm running an Intel 3570K on a Gigabyte Z77 motherboard. Thanks, Twitch, Tuxilla, and now Ditrion, my weekly source of hardware news in general, greenery. So what do you think so about that? So the first that? problem is what? He's on a Z77. Yep. And that's got two SATA 6 ports on it, doesn't it? And that's it. Ooh, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. You are yeah, correct. Yeah, so you're, you're running kind of mixed mode. Either you go to, you know, SATA... Three, wait, yeah, yeah, SATA, SATA 2 G speeds. No, it's SATA 6 is the latest. Good grief, I've been in well, this SATA too 3 long. or SATA 6 gigabit per second, whatever yep. that is. So, yep, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, you're, you're dealing with that issue. Uh, two different sizes. I mean, the RAID software should take care of that, it's gonna shrink one of the partitions on yep. the uh on the bigger drives. But the biggest problem is uh, you're going to have different IOPS on uh, on those. And so the RAID controller is going to have to work harder to figure out what's going to be writing what next and how long that's going to take. Typically, you want to have, have four identical drives or you know more. Uh, so it doesn't have to figure out the different speeds and uh, you know go to the, the, the lowest common denominator. Right. So I think that you just don't, you can do it. I know people who have had, but they also have discs up and drop and drop out of the raid or the raid degrades. You got to rebuild stuff. Um, and you know all about that. And if you've got a raid zero, if you're trying to do raid zero, one of those SSD drops in the whole drive is useless. Right. Yeah. So you could do RAID 1 plus 1, RAID 10. Is that what they call it? RAID 1, 0, 0 plus yeah, it's 1. different. But yeah, 0 plus 1 is different from 10 the way they do it. But yeah, it's okay. a, essentially. Uh, you know, you, you, you stripe them and then mirror them and you get some of the benefits of both. But then you're only doing half the capacity. I would not do this. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah. I just would kind of avoid it. Use that new SanDisk maybe as your primary drive and then just kind of suck it up and, uh, you know. Get a couple of spinning disks and, and do mirror yeah. on those or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure if Alan were here, he would he would, he would would cringe a little bit. when He would, he would scold us for our ineptitude at, at describing Raid. Uh, no. Well, that yes, that. But he would also uh, just be mad at Bradley here for trying to do mixed SSD Raid. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's do, we got a tweet here from Earl Cameron who asks, 
Can we please speculate about why NVIDIA lost the iMac contract and or the difference between the A8 and the A8X in the iPhone and iPad? I don't know anything about the what we could expect from the A8, A8X differences other than I think GPU performance. Um, the, yeah, I don't, the, I don't know enough about A8X to even yeah, I don't either. speculate. Not yeah. yet. No. Uh, as far as the iMac stuff... Uh, I think it's been for a couple of generations now that AMD has been the primary discrete graphics partner for Apple. And, and I mean, Apple goes back and forth. And I think what the main thing is the bottom dollar and as good as the and the amount of experience they have with drivers on the Apple platform. And AMD has been on Apple, well, since it was ATI and, and before. NVIDIA has been a little bit newer. But I wouldn't doubt if uh, AMD was giving Apple a little bit better uh, deal in terms of, you know, per chip prices. Uh, NVIDIA, as we know, they typically like to charge a little bit more for their products at the same performance, except, of course, these new GTX 970s kind of upset that once there for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, we don't know what happens inside uh, it seems like they do kind of spread the wealth in between NVIDIA and AMD, but lately AMD has been getting a few more nods, and yeah. I think a lot of that is just down to price. It's probably price. If you remember what was the uh, the mobile GPU generation that NVIDIA had all the problems with and they had all the write-downs on. Oh, the, um, the, the ball grid arrays that crack. Yeah. 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 That, that could be going into some of it. It could be uh, a lot of political crap going into it. Uh, but you remember, AMD is also in the Mac Pro, right, as the, the, the discrete Fire Pro parts in there. So, you know, if, if you're going to pick one, it makes sense to kind of transition them all over to one vendor, focus on that for drivers and application support. And then, you know, if you, you know, each generation comes around, you reevaluate and relook at stuff. So we'll be curious to see, right? If you look at NVIDIA and AMD's direction today, if you look at it, NVIDIA is making more power efficient parts than AMD is. Um, so when it comes time to introduce, you know, the next generation of iMac or, or whatever it is, MacBook Pros, I don't know if these and those even have discrete GPUs anymore, but uh, maybe they'll, maybe they'll change. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, our last little question here comes from Robbie Rutherford, uh, who wants to know if there's any new word on Broadwell release dates. Any new word on Broadwell release dates? Uh, nope, not really. Core M is supposedly shipping now. That is a Broadwell yeah. Y, super low power uh, mobile part. We talked about uh, Lenovo announcing their uh, Yoga 3 Pro here in this episode. That's supposedly shipping sometime soon. Uh, I've been trying to get a hold of like Asus announced the UX305 ZenBook. That uses a Core M uh, part as well, but they have basically just said, no, we don't have those available yet. They're not, they're not, they're not shipping. So I don't know if this was, it feels very odd for Intel to have announced a part um, I have seen some samples floating around, right? Uh, of a Dell or two, maybe an HP. But I haven't seen them for sale yet. And that's, again, it's kind of not like Intel in that regard. Uh, to Yeah, usually when they release them, there's product on the market for you to get. Yeah. And I, ha I have not seen that yet. As If you're interested, uh, Robbie, if you're interested in desktop, I still don't know. Um, I, I'm going to have to I say would imagine next year. late spring. Yeah, late spring next year. Yeah. Uh, We've seen about a what a year yearly update and refresh from it's Intel. It's been slower than normal, but yeah, I think that's I think that sounds about right. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's it. We're gonna wrap up the episode again. We need your emails, guys. Twitch at twit.tv. T w i c h at twit.tv. If you're new to the show, uh, I apologize that it was us two bringing you the news today. <laughs> but sorry. Uh, go to twit.tv slash twitch. Again, that's t w i c h. There is no second. T in that uh, abbreviation, uh, twit.tv slash twitch. You can find all of our back episodes, all our subscriptions to our audio versions, our video versions, uh, links to the stories that we talked about in today's episode as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, we'll be back next week. Probably Patrick will be back. I don't know. If not, maybe Who Josh knows? will be here again. Or maybe Patrick will be here and I'll be gone. And then you can be on the other side. Josh of, of the screen, you know, you just yeah. you never know. 
No. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, so we will see you guys next time. Oh, look, just like that. That's, that's how it could be. That's how it, it could be. be. We'll see you next so week, So much guys. better when I'm on the right. Thanks. Good night. See ya.